Australia is at risk of Sri Lankan chaos and revolution. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people. John, hello. Hello, Martin. Very important conversation this. Sri Lanka's in the middle of it. Absolutely. Um, extraordinary scenes uh, over the weekend in terms of uh, what we were seeing out of Colombo. Um, uh, it was, you know, Twitter in particular w w was a lot on Saturday and Sunday as uh, the Sri Lankan people had enough of uh, a poor government as well as a collapsing economy. And they uh, basically took out their frustrations on the Sri Lankan president. They stormed the presidential palace. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, I have to say, we were just saying off camera, Martin, how well this uh, Sri Lankan president is living. Um, huge, huge building. Yes, um, amazing swimming pool. <laughs> it's an amazing swimming pool. I've seen some of the pictures of uh, of the bedrooms. I mean, like uh, our Governor General and Prime Minister don't live as well as the Sri Lankan president. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, the other... Uh, extraordinary thing is it was seen by the world press as a um an attack against democracy you know uh, i uh, 9 11 or pearl harbor when there was a storming of the congress in the america on the january 6 and yet the world press has said little about the sri lankan um, situation where they stormed the presidential palace but they also fun enough um stormed the sri lankan central bank as well mm -hmm. so um all of the key institutions uh, were attacked uh, the Prime Minister has resigned. The uh, Finance Minister uh, attempted to escape, who's the brother of the President, and he was stopped by airport officials and protesters. And uh, we, we have complete chaos in Sri Lanka. And, and one of the important um, things that I want to bring to the audience's attention about what led to the Sri Lankan collapse is we've covered this whole uh, spectre of, of this subject uh, back in 2019. So in essence, Martin, Sri Lanka defaulted on its foreign debt. Now, um, uh, back in 2019, uh, we interviewed uh, Dr. Peter Brain uh, about his book, Credit Code Red, because Australia has a uh, foreign debt problem as well. Um, and his thesis of his book that he wrote with, the, with one of his colleagues was that we were going to uh, potentially uh, default on, on, on Australia's foreign debt and that he was warning about that. And uh, so, so I think what we're going to try to do today is explain to our audience what happened in Sri Lanka and what are the key lessons for Australia at the same time. Yeah, no, I think it's a good conversation, bearing in mind that uh, our foreign debt is probably um, somewhat, bigger, somewhat bigger than it was. And there's a little bit of a question about how this is going to play out here as well. So good time to have this conversation. Indeed, indeed. Now, now the, the, the other thing is, is that for, for those who have been following my work for since 2018, um, uh, if we can just put slide four on the screen, Martin. Um, so, so we have um, in my economic Armageddon thesis, or I had six scenarios. So, so one of the scenarios was a local currency crisis. Um, um, and, and that's, you know, that's what that Peter Brain book was talking about, and that's what Sri Lanka has gone about as well. So, so, so this uh, event of where you have rising interest rates and then you have a problem servicing your foreign debt, um, that was one of the things that I wrote about uh, four years ago, and that has come to pass in, in the context of Sri Lanka. Mm. And it was uh, ticking away for a little while, but really it's been the last few months that Sri Lanka has really um, had huge issues and of course as you say it's turned into a set of social issues as well as a set of financial issues absolutely um w one of the key metrics that that our audience needs to remember um is that anytime you've had a collapsing um currency where there's been a default on the foreign debt um the key metric that comes up time and time again is is when net foreign debt is above 50 percent so so when i looked at uh, the sri lankan uh, uh, situation in the last couple of days, what I found was that at the end of 2021, uh, foreign debt as a proportion of Sri Lankan GDP was at about 60%. So, so their foreign debt was about 51 billion US and their, the size of their economy was around 85 billion. So we get to around 60%. Now, in the context of Australia, uh, now, for the last few years, we have been above 50% in terms of our net foreign debt. Um, uh, in the last quarter, we actually came down a bit. So a few years ago, around 2018, 20, 2019, net foreign debt as a proportion of GDP in Australia was 60%. Now, in the, uh, in, at the end of the December quarter of 2021, we were at 55%, and we've had a bit of a dip. At the end of March quarter, we were at 50.13%. 50, 50 so uh, it looks like we've had a slight improvement 
in our foreign debt uh, our foreign debt position overall, but it's still above this danger zone. And because it is above that danger zone, um, you know, we, we still we have a you know we have a big issue um, uh, in terms of in terms of in terms of the foreign debt. But but obviously, uh, one of the things that you and I have been debating over the last couple of days is, you know, the the RBA raising rates. Um, you know, is, is part of the motiv- part of the motivation is to maintain confidence and stability in the dollar because uh, what ha- as we'll go through this in a second, what happened in the Sri Lankan context was that uh, runaway inflation led to a collapse in the Sri Lankan currency, um, and that ultimately led to a default of their foreign debt. So you know, maintaining confidence uh, and, and value in your currency is critical. Otherwise, you 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 start to spiral way out of control. And the debt calculation, that includes public debt and private debt? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so what are the lessons for Australia? So, so we have a foreign debt problem. Now, uh, we, we're going to cover this in a future post, but uh, one, one of the big concerns that Peter Brain had was uh, how much foreign debt do we owe um, uh, within, within the first 12 months? Um, now, when we did the show in 2019, it was about 700 billion. Um, I, look, I looked at it um, uh, over the last uh, 24 hours. It, we owe about 928 billion of foreign debt uh, with a one year maturity or less. The amount of assets we have is about $250 billion short of that. And so, so we have a gap of our one year maturity foreign debt uh, to the tune of 250 billion. And when you look at the foreign exchange reserves at the RBA, it's not. It's not that. You know, it's only about eighty billion. So, 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 so we. So, if we had a situation where um, our creditors lost confidence in our ability to repay, the amount of money we would have to stump up um, in, a, in a in a twelve month period, we're, we're short two hundred fifty billion. The RBA doesn't have two hundred fifty billion to to meet that gap, and we could easily go into a Sri Lankan situation. If things were uh, to unravel, and and while some people may think this is, um, you know, perhaps a, a, a you know a, a bit of hysteria in the case of our discussion vis-a-vis Australia, this 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 scenario is what Peter Brain, who has a knack for forecasting crises, uh, and we discussed that in, in the last post. Uh, he he, this is what the, this Sri Lankan situation is what he precisely predicted for Australia. Right, and so the implication is that you know we are actually close to a very important tipping point, and if at some point our international investors lose faith in what we're doing here, then we could actually end up going down the same route, and it wouldn't take that much to tip us over. Precisely, precisely. So, so, so yeah. So, so while the RBA is saying we're going to raise rates in Australia to get inflation under control. Um, um, and to um, you know, try to slow down the economy. Uh, in the background, what the thinking at the RBA would be is, um, if inflation starts to rage out of control relative to our peers, and if we keep interest rates too low, compared to, particularly compared to the Americans, the exchange rate is going to collapse, um, and that could have a balance of payments crisis like we did in 1985-86. And, and then at that point, then you have a really critical decision as to do you save the currency? And if you by saving the currency, you've got to dramatically raise rates, not like we have in the last three months, but you, you basically have to go five to ten percent very quickly, yeah. like uh, like what has what has happened in Sri Lanka. Or if you don't save the currency, then you end up in a foreign de- default, um, and then you have runaway inflation. In the order of fifty to one hundred percent. So, so, so these are the nightmare scenarios. But uh, obviously, uh, we have we haven't sort of um, put ourselves in a in a, in a good position. Um, and so, when uh, and again, you know, one of the key messages we've we've been pushing for the last uh, four years as we've been doing this show is Australians. A lot of Australians think that we have a standard of living which we earn or we are entitled to. No, the last 20 to 25 years, we have lived a particular way in Australia using a big international credit card. Um, and, 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 you know, in, um, in net terms, we owe the world $1.2 trillion. In gross terms, 
it's about two and a half trillion. And so um, that's how that's why we that's why we live um, um, the way we live, not because we produce goods and services and sell them to the world that they want to buy our products at prices we can uh, charge. Um, it is because we are living beyond our means and not just in terms of uh, the household sector, the government and, and the f corporate sector as well. And so we've got a big international credit card that we have to pay. And uh, yeah, so unfortunately, we don't have anyone who uh, is willing to uh, come to our rescue at, at this point in time. Mm, and of course, just to underscore, as interest rates internationally go up, the cost of that credit also goes up. So it's putting a bigger and bigger break, if you like, on the activity and the momentum in the economy too.